We continue our study of Luke, and we are in Luke, the 17th chapter. Uh, we uh, uh, finished, of course, the last time we were together, Luke 16, speaking of the rich man and Lazarus, and that's, of course, a very interesting passage, and we uh, went through the different uh, uh, positions as far as where are the dead, and even though it's an interesting question to discuss, the main thing that we need to be concerned about is where we will be when the judgment takes place. Where will our final destiny be? And that's what we need to be preparing for uh, above everything else. So Luke 17 begins, he said to his disciples, it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to him through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he would cause one of these little ones to stumble. Jesus emphasizes here that the person who is doing the tempting, the person who puts the stumbling block ahead of another is responsible. Woe to him through whom they come. And then he gives that very graphic example in verse 2 uh, concerning the person who puts a stumbling block before another. Now the Apostle Paul would elaborate upon this in writing about uh, matters of expediency and how we are to treat our brother or sister in matters of no difference, in matters of no consequence. But this is simply an elaboration of what the Lord said himself in Proverbs 6 uh, talking about the, these six things the Lord hates, seven are an abomination, and the, the last one he lists is he who sows discord among brethren. It is a serious matter indeed when brothers or sisters in Christ intentionally cause others to stumble or intentionally divide a church. Now, sometimes divisions are going to happen no matter what we do. And on occasion, as the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians, that it is uh, good that a division takes place so that those who are proved might be made manifest. Not all division is bad, but the division that is caused by us over matters of no consequence is something that the Lord takes very, very seriously. And that's what he's addressing here. Then he says, verse 3, Be on your guard. If your brother sins... Rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. Now that is, is something that is amazing for us to consider, much less for the disciples in Jesus' day. If your brother sins, rebuke him. We have an obligation when we know someone is in sin to try to get that person to see their error. But then he says, if he repents, forgive him. I've known brethren in years gone by, and I'm sure you have too, that were not about to forgive someone, did not have it within them to forgive someone. They were going to hold that over that person for the rest of their life. And it's a sad thing indeed. But he says, if he sins against you seven times a day. Now we understand that that is a figure of speech that the Lord is using. He's using the exaggeration to make a point. In other words, we've got to be ready at all times to forgive our brethren. Seven times a day and returns to you seven times. Now that number seven, as we know, is the perfect Hebrew number. So that's the symbolic, of course, of uh, what Jesus is speaking of. We've got to be ready at all times to say, I forgive you, when someone says, I repent. And now look at the reaction of the apostles. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Isn't that our response sometimes? We talk about forgiveness and forgiving someone who wrongs us, increase my faith. How can I forgive that person? I think of um, the tragic uh, circumstance several years back concerning the Winklers with uh, the tragedy that occurred with uh, Matthew Winkler being shot and then all that transpired afterward. But the Dan Winkler and his wife 
Oh, actually forgave Mary, the one who did such. And it was all that they could do. I know it was all they could do to forgive them. And I know that because Brother Winkler talked about it on one occasion. In, oh, I was present in the audience when he was talking about uh, bringing himself to forgive. And he knew that if he could not and would not forgive, he would not be forgiven himself. That's a difficult thing to consider. Extremely difficult. But the thing is, we've got to be able to do it. Have it within ourselves to forgive someone. I think I've told you before that in my and Brenda's life, that we've had over the years people who have done us wrong, brethren who have done us wrong, who to this hour have not come to us and said, um, I'm sorry, or please forgive me. And honestly, we don't expect they ever will. But if it was the case that they were to come and say, you know, we were wrong in what we said, we were wrong in what we did, would you forgive me? We would do it in a heartbeat. Because if we don't, we won't receive forgiveness. And that's what Jesus is emphasizing. We've got to be a forgiving people. Now somebody says, you never forget. Well, this idea of forgive and forget, you never forget because of memory, human memory being what it is. What you do is what Paul did and put it behind you. Put those things behind and press on toward those things which are before. Paul never completely forgot what he did in persecuting Christians. He was still thinking about that toward the end of his life calling himself the chief of sinners, saying that I did many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, things of that nature. He all, it was on his mind, but he never allowed it to dominate his thinking. He put it in the past where it belonged. So sometimes that's what we've got to do. Put those things behind us and press on, move on. And that's the only way we can really deal with it. Some folks are not willing to put it behind them. They live in the past it dominates their thinking, it dominates their emotions, and it completely wrecks them as a, in their personality and their psychology. And as they are as Christians or children of God, it affects them in every way because they can't give that up. They can't turn loose of it. Uh, they can't forgive themselves, possibly, as well as forgiving others. It's something that the Lord knew would be a, would be a problem for us, human nature being what it is and the mind being what it is and psychology being what it is. So he knew he needed to address it, and he did. And the apostles were amazed at it. The Lord replied, verse 6, If you had faith like a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, Be uprooted and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. A mulberry tree is a deep-rooted tree with a black mulberries growing on it. I think I've talked about the mustard seed before. I wish I had that mustard seed still that was given to us in Life of Christ class and Freed Hardeman many years ago. Everett uh, Hufford, who has now passed away, who was a longtime missionary to Jerusalem, gave each one of us in his class on Life of Christ a little cellophane pack with a mustard seed in it. And it was a tiny thing. But he said the, the mustard seeds we have now are actually bigger than the mustard seeds that they had in the first century, if you can believe that. A tiny little thing. If our faith is just like a mustard seed, just a tiny faith, we can accomplish great things. Which of you, verse 7, having a slave plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in from the field, Come immediately and sit down to eat. But will he not say to him, Prepare something for me to eat and properly clothe yourself and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you may eat and drink? He does not thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded, does he? He's saying that duty is coexistent with ability. He's using a common example of his day to emphasize the truth, which is the next verse. So you too. When you do all the things which are commanded you, say we are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we have ought to, done, ought to have done. I think the, um, 
uh, King James Version says we are uh, unprofitable servants. It's the way that it renders that, renders that phrase. I think the English Standard Version says unworthy servants, which I like that because it flows better. But still, unworthy slaves, we have done only that which we ought to have done, or the King James says that which was our duty to do. How often have I heard my dad quote that verse over the years when he was preaching and teaching? He would come back to this verse over and over again. At the end of the day, son, he'd tell me, we're just unworthy servants. We've done that which was our duty to do. The point, we need not think that we can do more than enough as children of God. Because... Salvation is of grace. It's not of merit. We can never think that we can do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, and have the Lord paid as far as meeting our obligation and paying our debt. We can never, we can never, we can never do that. We are servants, literally slaves to the Lord. That's how Paul described himself as a doulos. We are all that, slaves to the Lord. So what we're doing is our obligation, our duty. But we can never think that we have earned what we receive because we're doing it. We can never earn salvation. We can never deserve it. We deserve to die. We deserve to bleed. We deserve to be put to death violently for what we have done because of our sins. But by the grace and mercy of our Lord, we're all saved. It's through our obedience we obtain that grace, no doubt about it. And we must be obedient servants, no question about it. But at the end of the day, it's God's grace. It's his grace that saves. By grace... Have you been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves? It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And that's what he's emphasizing right here. At the end of the day, when we do all the things that are commanded us, we're unworthy servants, unworthy. We don't deserve it one bit in the world. And if we keep that in mind, if we keep that thought in mind, it will guard us from having this mentality of, well, I have arrived. I'm here. You're here. And you've got to come up to my level. No, sir. No, ma'am. That's not how it works in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, the ground is level at the foot of the cross in the spiritual sense. All of us are growing. All of us have different levels of maturity, no doubt. But at the end of the day, all of us, are unworthy. All of us don't deserve what we've received. All of us will be saved by God's grace. And if we keep that in mind, it will really keep us being humble in the best sense possible. Any questions, comments before we move on? That's a very significant verse, at least it's been in my life, thinking about it, pondering on it, uh, considering the implications of it. And um, I just wanted to stress that before we moved in. Verse 11. While he was on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him. And they raised their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Now, Leviticus 13, 46 required lepers to stay at a distance away from uh, the Jews. I just happened to see a re rerun of the movie Papillon with uh, Steve McQueen and uh, Dustin Hoffman. I saw a little bit of it flipping through the channels while we were in Tahoe. And I remember that part of that movie was about the fact that he went to a leper colony. The guy that the Steve McQueen's character, after he escaped from the prison colony, went to a leper colony to try to get a boat to take him away because they were the only ones that had anything, and he had to stay a bit of a distance away because leprosy was so contagious. A very interesting scene. But still, in this sense, in the Mosaic Law, 
The law required the leper to stay a distance away, not only for physical reasons, but for spiritual reasons as well, being unclean spiritually and also being contaminated literally with the disease. Verse 14, when he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. That's what the law required the leper to do. Leviticus required a leper to show himself to the priest to be ceremonially cleansed. And it says, and as they were going, they were cleansed. Now get this picture. Here are these lepers, these ten leprous men who are going to get cleansed by the priest are wanting to do the right thing, obviously, or Jesus wouldn't have told them this. As they're going to the priest, one by one, the leprosy disappears and they're made whole. Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. Luke adds that sentence right there at the end of that verse through inspiration. And he was a Samaritan. And get this picture. Ten leprous men, all of them with leprosy, wanting to do right. And because of this disease, this Samaritan was in fellowship with the Jews. Whereas if they did not have that disease, those Jews likely would have shunned him. But because they had that disease in common, they were in fellowship one with another. Then Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But the nine... Where are they? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? Boy, that's a really big commentary, isn't it? The Samaritan is the only one that comes back and glorifies God. The rest did not. And he said to him, stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. So not only is he cleansed ceremonially, not only is he cleansed physically, now he's cleansed spiritually by what the Lord has said. Now having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming, here's that perennial question that they ask him. They understand the Jews did at this time the kingdom would be a conquering kingdom that would overthrow the existing order of things and reestablish the Davidic kingdom in Jerusalem. He answered them and said, The kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed. Nor will they say, Look here it is, or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Now what is he saying? He's saying that the nature of the kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. It's not a physical kingdom. It's not a conquering kingdom. They have complete, a completely different concept of the kingdom in mind than what the Lord had and that what the Old Testament prophesied concerning. It is a spiritual kingdom and not a conquering kingdom. Then he says to the disciples, the days will come when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. They will say to you, look there, look here, do not go away and do not run after them. Now, pausing right here. After the Lord would be ascended back to the heavens. In the years following, there would be those who would rise up claiming to be the Messiah and would draw disciples after them. And Jesus is warning his apostles not to go after those individuals. Then he says, for just like the lightning when it flashes out of one part of the sky, shines to the other part of the sky, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. And just as it happened in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were being given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. You know, a bunch of us went to the ark encounter in Kentucky a couple of weeks ago, and that is an extraordinary structure. That uh, boat that they assembled uh, in the dimensions uh, given in the, in the Old Testament, uh, the immense size of it just is mind-blowing 
And to think that something of that size was being constructed in those days. And Noah was preaching the whole time that that, Noah was under that, that boat was under construction. It's an amazing thing to think about. But his generation completely rejected his preaching. Uh, as far as human beings are concerned, as far as human nature is concerned, we would think he was a failure because he only had a total of eight converts, himself, his wife, his sons, and their wives. Out of all those people, only eight people saved. But the Lord thought it was an extremely high success because uh, that whole sinful generation was wiped out and they were able to start over once again. But when it came, people th were thinking that everything was just as it always been, has, had been. And it was, verse 28, the same as happened in the days of Lot. They were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling, they were planting, they were building. But on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. He uses again Sodom and Gomorrah. The cities of the plain, as an example. Everybody thought that life was going on as it always had been, and then it happened. Now, according to uh, Glenn Beck in his Bible miniseries that came on several years ago, it was ninja angels that destroyed the cities of the plain. You remember the ninja angels in the book of Genesis, right? Of course not, because it's not there. But I was watching that thing, and it showed the destruction. All of a sudden, these angels come in dressed in ninja outfits. I kid you not, white ninja outfits with swords. Where in the world are they getting this? It's not from the text. What happened was the Lord rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed all of those cities. It will be just the same, verse 30, on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. On that day... The one who is on the housetop and whose goods are in the house must not go down to take them out. And likewise, the one who is in the field must not turn back. And then he simply says, remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. You remember that, don't you? They were told not to look back at the city. And what did she do? She turned back and looked. And she was made a pillar of salt. Don't look back. Why did she look back? We're not told. There's been a lot of speculation as to why she did. Simple fact is she did. And she was punished for it. And that is used by the Lord as an example. In other words, don't delay. Don't, don't uh, 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 tarry in what you're doing. He's talking here about specifically the destruction of Jerusalem that will take place in AD 70. And then our AD 70 friends come forward and say, yeah, see, that's the whole thing. And then he tells that's not the whole thing in the New Testament. It's a significant event, yes. The Lord talks about it at length, yes. But that's not when the final judgment took place. And that's not when all of the uh, prophecies and all of the, what was said about the final uh, destruction of the world was to take place. It was a significant event in that the Jewish order would be completely and totally wiped out. And Jerusalem itself would be gone as a center of, uh, of spiritual things. But still, he's using that as a metaphor for the final judgment, of course. Whoever seeks to keep his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, on that night, there will be two in one bed. One will be taken and the other will be left. There will be two women grinding at the same place. One will be taken and the other will be left. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other will be left. And our religious friends that believe in a so-called rapture theory say, Aha, you see? Will you be ready when the rapture comes? In case of rapture, this vehicle will be unoccupied. Have you ever seen that bumper sticker? Or there will be movies and television shows that have been made over the years, and all of a sudden somebody disappears, and another person's left behind. Left behind? You heard about that book and that series? It's warmed over dispensational premillennialism is what it amounts to. 
And the word rapture is never found in the New Testament. This concept of the rapture is never found in the New Testament. But what is he talking about here? In context, he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem that will take place, yes, in AD 70. The larger picture, of course, is using that as a metaphor for the final judgment. But what does he mean about one taken and the other left? It is a figure of speech indicating be prepared, be ready. Be ready at all times. Not saying that somebody's going to be left on earth and somebody's going to be taken up to heaven. That's not taught anywhere in the New Testament. The clear passages, the clear passages about the second coming of our Lord indicate that all people will be judged at the same time. John 8 talks about the fact that uh, we all, both the dead and the living, will be caught up into the judgment. Uh, we've got to be ready for that. We've got to be prepared because if we're not, then we will be, uh, we will be, uh, I don't know what happened with that. Something, I've heard something, all of a sudden my phone starts talking to me. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. At any rate, getting back to what I was trying to say, we've got to be ready for the second coming the second coming of our Lord. I thought I had my sound turned off, but anyway, we got that done. Verse 37, and answering, they said to him, where, Lord? And he said to him, and he said to them, where the body is, there also the vultures will be gathered. King James says the eagles will be gathered. Actually, the word is vultures. In other words, a bird of prey, that's the picture uh, where the carcass or the body is. In other words, the uh, rotting carcass of Judaism is ready to be completely destroyed. That's the context of really what he's talking about. But in the larger context, he's using that as a metaphor for the second coming. Uh, and that's what we need to keep in mind. Before we move on, and I, as I gather my composure as a result of that, uh, any questions or comments? Anything before we move into chapter 18? Yes? No doubt. No doubt. I agree full, 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 complete, wholeheartedly with you. Uh, because too many of my brethren think that those left behind books and dispensational premillennialism, that that explains everything about uh, the passages concerning the second coming. And it's as wrong as it can possibly be. We've got to be able to answer, we've got to be able to give an answer. Uh, I will, yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Gratitude. Gratitude is something that we've always got to keep in mind. Thankfulness. We live in a great country, brethren. We live in a beautiful country. Uh, I, was, I was reminded of that when we traveled to Tahoe, uh, when we got a rental car at the airport and drove the last leg while the sun was still shining. Drove literally up the mountain, up to about 7,000 plus feet up. The mountains and the beauty of God's scenery is just a sight to behold. Passing by that lake every day, going to and from the encampment, looking at the beauty that God made is just something that just boggles your mind. And to think that the Lord has allowed us to live in a country like this and to enjoy blessings that we have every day, that we're able to get up and have a roof over our head, 
and have food that we can eat and clothes that we can wear. To think that we've got those blessings and there's a lot of people in this world that don't enjoy that and they're thankful for what they have. We've got to be thankful for what we have. We have to be grateful people, people of gratitude. And then to the, the other point about uh, premillennialism, Four E. Wallace Jr. wrote an outstanding book about, about premillennialism uh, called God's Prophetic Word. You can still get it, and it's about that thick. It's not a slow, I mean, it's not a fast read, but it's thorough. And it will, uh, it will do more than anything to dispel the false ideas of premillennialism. There's another small book that you can get from Clyde Woods in Henderson, Tennessee by E.R. Harper called Prophecy Foretold, Prophecy Fulfilled. Uh, it's a series of radio sermons that Brother Harper delivered many years ago responding to uh, Richard DeHaan and Billy Graham and uh, others uh, I think um, uh, Armstrong, Gar not Garner Ted, but his father, Herbert W. Armstrong in the world tomorrow, if you remember that. Uh, he responded to all of that and responded to it thoroughly by what the scriptures teach. And so I would recommend those books to uh, read and to study as, as well as uh, past issues of the spiritual sword that have dealt with premillennialism in a very good way. All of that will really give you the answers that you need. Any other questions, comments before we move on to chapter 18? All right, chapter 18. Now, he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart. All times to pray. Men ought always to pray and not faint is what the King James says there. I like the way King James renders that verse. We ought always to pray. Always. How often do we pray? How is our prayer life? That's a very searching question, isn't it? We need to make sure our prayer life is as it ought to be. Saying, in a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. There was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him, saying, give me legal protection for my opponent. For a while he was unwilling. But afterward he said to himself, even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. <laughs> sort of a humorous, a little bit of a humorous example the Lord gives. You think about this judge, he doesn't care anything, you know, about re in religion, and this widow keeps coming to it, and keeps coming, and keeps coming, keeps coming, just every day, persistent. She's going to wear me out. I'll go ahead and give her what she wants. Then he says, the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge said. Now will not God bring about justice for his elect to cry to him day and night? And will he delay long over them? Sometimes it seems if we keep on going to the Lord, we, sometimes in our mind we say, Lord, it's me again. <laughs> in other words, I've come to you so many times about this. It's me again. Uh, well, sometimes we... Sometimes I think we could have that mentality. You know, am I wearing out the Lord? You can't wear out the Lord. You can't wear him out. He will bring about justice. Now, it will be in his own time. It will be in his time frame and not ours. And he might accomplish it in a different way than what we think he will do or what we suppose he would do, but he'll accomplish it. I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. Who? Those who are patient in prayer, those who are long-suffering in prayer, those who are engaged in prayer. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Boy, that is a potent question. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Will he? Will he find faith? How many of our brethren engage in persistent, penitent prayer? How many of us engage in it? Do we? Do we pray enough? That's a question all of us need to ask ourselves. Is the only time that we engage in prayer when we sit down for a meal? That's something that we need to ask ourselves. Prayer. 
is something we've got to be involved in. And he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. We don't have that problem today, do we? Oh, yeah, we do. Some that view themselves as righteous and treat others with contempt, oh, yes, we've still got that problem. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. You've got the two extremes of Jewish life right here. Think about it. You've got the Pharisee, who is the one who is strict in accordance with the law. That is, his reputation says that. The reality was quite different. And then you've got a tax collector who is despised. He's a guy that's going to cook the books, and he's going to skim off the top for his own purposes too often. Despised by society. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other people. Swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. My, my, my. The Lord ought to be proud he's got you as a follower of his, right? Boasting, prideful, it's wrong. Think about it. He's standing there thinking to himself, I'm just in good shape. And look at that old tax collector over there. Not anything like him. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Absolutely. He's lifting himself up. You know, I'm not like all these other folks. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. He's got an eye problem, doesn't he? And by the way, the word I in the Greek is the word ego. He's got an ego problem. That's a little humor there. Anyway, I, 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 he's fasting, he's paying tithes, all of this about himself. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, notice this difference. The tax collector standing off from a distance from the holy place was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven. You think in your mind the Pharisee's looking up to the sky and in himself he's thinking all this. And the tax collector standing off from a distance got his head bowed and he's not even willing to look up. Not even willing to look up to heaven. But was beating his breast. Doing this. Doing that saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. That's all he was saying. He was fully aware of his sins and his shortcomings. And he knew that was the main reason why he needed to pray to the Lord. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled but he who humbles himself will be exalted. We can't ever think that we've arrived. Never. Never, never. None of us have. None of us are so spiritually mature and so much in our growth to where, you know, the Lord's fortunate to have me as one of his servants. Can never think that. Not once. We've got to be aware of our shortcomings, aware of our limitations, and thankful, grateful for God's love, his grace, and his mercy. That's what the Lord desires of all of us. Well, this is where we'll stop. We'll resume our study next week with verse 15.